known I've known History Forum for uh, over 50 years now, and uh, I'll try to get that recording off the screen. And I have lots of great memories, especially of parties at my house, and uh, I believe several relationships that began or got a, a boost along the way. Can, can I claim yours, Mindy, as one of them? Okay. <laughs> sure can. Yep, um, at least two marriages that I know of. All right. Yes. <laughs> so that my proudest accomplishment, with, without a doubt. Uh, but there are there are moments when you come to realize that uh, you're no longer young, and I, I suppose uh, Leslie got that picture, and uh, uh, I'm afraid that that shows it. Well, at any rate, uh, Golden Eagles, I'm. Uh, thank you for protecting the nest, and I hope you're protecting uh, your your nests, uh, and. Why are we protecting now? But why are we gold, golden eagles? Well, it's part of a slightly bigger story that after World War II, veterans came back and, to, and went to college in just unprecedented numbers. And many of them wanted what they saw as the real college life. And we'll talk about that a, a bit later. But among those things that people associated with college was a mascot. And they had a vote between the bear, the badger, the beaver, and the golden eagle. And I figure the three bees uh, canceled each other out, uh, and the golden eagle uh, won. And you may wonder why uh, he's called Ellsworth. Well, he didn't have really a, a shape for a while. And then a few years later, a center on the football team, who was also a cartoonist, uh, did this painting that uh, you, you see here and in what is now uh, Lathrop Hall, our first stu uh, student union. And uh, he named it after his football coach, Robert Ellsworth Boozer. Uh, and that's probably a name you may you know if you've been to football games that the field is named after, uh, after Bob uh, to, to this day. Uh, but at any rate, very much an American story, this assumption that college should be uh, a community uh, and those students returning really wanted that. But now let's look at the whole sweep of uh, uh, Brockport history, 180, 86 uh, years. Um, and that's a hell of a lot of history. And we certainly, I'm not gonna try to drag you through all of it. Uh, instead, I'm going to, look at three watershed periods that were critical to creating the Brockport we know today. Um, certainly, uh, well, I should say before that, if you have questions, you can either put them in chat or I'll stop after each section of the lecture and uh, you can ask uh, qu questions uh, then. At any rate, Brock, both the village of Brockport and the college are very much creatures of the Erie Canal. And here's the, the ceremony opening the canal called the Wedding of the Waters. That barrel of water had been taken out of Lake Erie uh, and had gone the whole canal through Brockport and down to New York. And there it was poured into New York uh, Harbor. And soon passengers were commuting on it. Uh, next, um, Leslie. Uh, we're soon commuting on it, um, and one of the first commuters would be the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, who uh, was on his famous 50th anniversary of the revolution. He came through Brockport and left us with a street named Fayette Street in his honor, uh, but also probably in range of two million immigrants. Uh, went through the Erie Canal on their way out uh, to the Midwest. I mean, it's quite something to imagine all these people going to start new lives. But what really gave Brockport its start uh, was two years earlier when uh, the canal builders had to blast their way uh, through the eponymous uh, Lockport. And while they did, uh, canal ended at Brockport and that uh, enriched uh, a man named Heil Brockway, among others, uh, and really put Brockport uh, on, on, the, on the map. So 10 years after the canal had opened, 
Um, Brockport was a canal boom town of brook and brook good brick and wood frame houses, um, many of which are st are still uh, evident in Brockport. Uh, but it's a small village, about a, perhaps a thousand people, and perhaps another thousand in the environs out in Sweden, Sweden Township. It certainly had had churches. Um, Western New York, as you may know, was called the Burned Over District because it was the source of the Second uh, Great Awakening. Uh, so there are Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian churches. Soon there'd be Episcopalian and uh, Catholic. Uh, there was a fire department, but still a, a fairly small uh, town and hardly one that you would think would create a college. But in fact, uh, they had really an improbable dream. Um, and I'd like to put it a little bit in international context. In Europe, colleges, universities were largely created by the central government and or an established church. Uh, but in America, it was quite different. Uh, the uh, colleges were largely created uh, uh, by uh, local, regional, and, and state um, groups. And most were driven by two forces, boosterism, and denominationalism. Well, the boosterism uh, was particularly uh, financed by Heil Brockway, uh, who, when he heard that the Baptist, uh, the Baptist Missionary Convention wanted to establish a college in Western New York, he uh, provided six acres, the land that Hartwell Hall sits on to, uh, to this day, as well as $3,000 uh, to start building uh, a, a building. And the, the result uh, would be this, uh, this building. Uh, when we imagine uh, relatively small houses, uh, it must have been really imposing to have this four-story building with a, with a cupola um, uh, on it. So it opens as a Baptist college in 1835. Uh, but as you, as history students, you probably know in 1837, there was a uh, deep depression probably triggered by Andrew Jackson's attack on the National Bank uh, and the college and the Baptist Missionary Convention went bankrupt. So for a few years, uh, the building uh, played no educational purpose. Apparently it was used as a stable uh, at, at one point, uh, but then the Townsfolk rallied, boosterism uh, came to play, and they built a new uh, building uh, here. Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't build a new building. <laughs> Let me take that back. Uh, but rather, they restarted the institution uh, as the Brockport Collegiate uh, Institute. Now, the Brockport, while it said it's Collegiate Institute, it sort of properly fudged the level. Um, that it was what usually was called an academy at the time. Um, academies don't fit at all into our modern lockstep of grade levels and so on. Academies would off, might have small children and they might be teaching uh, Latin at a, at a college uh, level. Um, and at any rate, you see here the, uh, um, the bulletin, uh, the, I suppose what the admissions department of the time uh, would, would have uh, sent, sent out. Um, and a facu faculty of, of six. Um, we don't know a lot about uh, the Brockport uh, uh, Collegiate Institute, uh, but I would like to read to you just two observations uh, of it. Uh, first, from a David Black who taught languages at the college, um, and he said the school was large, four male teachers and four female teachers. Well, that's large for that time. The building is of stone, four stories in height, 60 feet by 100 feet. It's divided by two halls, one of which belongs to the female department. They were, the officials did all they could to keep the genders apart. Uh, there are four general school rooms, a large chapel, 32 rooms for students, 14 uh, uh, of which two, two each, 14 square feet to each is attached a, a bedroom. 
how about from the student side? Well, um, a student named Eugenia Peckham, uh, who was in the class of 1845, Port Collegiate Institute, and on seeing perhaps this uh, advertisement, uh, she wrote a poem on seeing a picture of the Brockport Collegiate Institute. Uh, not necessarily poetry that will live forever, but uh, so I, an early case, I guess, of, of alumni nostalgia. I love on these pictured walls to glaze and recall the scenes of other days. While I trotted halls uh, with footsteps free, and naught of grief to trouble me. I have hoarded long as a treasured thing, the joys that my schoolgirl memories bring, and naught on life's pathway seems so fair as the gladsome days when my home was there. Uh, and sadly, she was quite right that uh, life later would not be so trouble-free. She taught for a while and then very sadly died in, in childbirth. Well, the college almost died uh, also in 1954, uh, 1954, how about 1854? Um, a, the, the rumor is that a student skipped chapel and that he was making candy and he managed to burn the entire building uh, down. And that might well have been the end of, this, of the story. Uh, but in fact, again, the townspeople rallied and borrowed some money from Rochester and uh, a new structure e emerged. Ah, I'm sorry, I, I failed to advance. This, but this is Eugenia Peckham, that's my, my fault. Okay, who wrote that poem? Okay, here was the new building. Uh, uh, you know, obviously a, a good bit uh, larger uh, and it, it did pretty well for a while. And by the way, if you look at the, fat, well, we'll look at the faculty in a minute, but um, it was uh, obviously larger than that, that earlier building, a somewhat romantic uh, picture uh, of it. And it did pretty well until the Civil War. But the Civil War uh, drew away, obviously, uh, young men. Uh, it it uh, also drew philanthropic money uh, elsewhere. Uh, and the college was uh, having going through another near-death experience. It was really uh, on the ropes. Uh, and it was, uh, the trustees were considering closing it down. Well, at that point, New York State uh, threw Brockport a lifeline. And that was through what was called the normal school movement. That up until then, teachers had been trained in academies like Brockport Collegiate Institute. But Horace Mann, sort of the patron saint of American public education, um, on a German model, uh, campaign. Um, and institutions that strangely were called normal schools. Uh, you may wonder about that because we're not normal, we're above average, right? Uh, well, the reason is it was a mistranslation uh, of the French. Uh, Napoleon had established an école normale supérieure um, in Paris uh, among the grande écoles that, it, that he created. And this was the one for for, for education, but in French, normal meant a model uh, rather than, than just uh, a average. Well, New York State had two normal schools at that point, one Albany, one in Oswego, uh, but then uh, the, the legislature was convinced to fund four more and there was vicious competition for it. Um, and Brockport won the competition, um, making the best bid um, it was offering uh, the building uh, as well as money to build two wings to, to expand uh, the, the, the building. Unfortunately, they hadn't consulted with the taxpayers about raising this money. And especially to those out in Sweden Township, the college seemed like an elite institution that they saw no reason to fund. And there was a vote as to whether to raise the funds, and it lost. Um, they, then more people voted against it than for it. However, thank God, this was bef uh, before the secret ballot. And someone noticed that 
the taxes paid by the minority who uh, had voted yes were greater uh, than the taxes paid by those who voted no. And so, we, you know, democracy needs leadership at times. And so they recounted uh, and uh, it, it went through. I mean, I've always hated the secret ballot. I mean, I, you know, before it, when you voted, you got a turkey, you got a bottle of whiskey, you got something. Now all I get is, a, you know, one of those little bloody stickers that I voted. Oh, well. At any rate, if it, we'd had the secret ballot back then, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking today. Well, um, in, with, with the money, and they could construct a grander uh, structure. And as you uh, look here, you see the two wings that that money that was uh, procured by hook or by crook uh, provided a, a much larger uh, in, in institu institution. Um, and Leslie, if you want to move to the next one, uh, here is a, an overview of Brockport at the time. And you, if you look toward the up, upper right, uh, you'll see school looming over the town uh, must have been a very very impressive uh, but also impressive is if you look cutting down from the uh, right sort of through much of the center uh, is Erie Canal and um, various industries along the canal and I might note that for instance the first McCormick Reapers uh, were were made uh, in in Brockport uh, so a time where Brockport was at its industrial uh, peak. Um, the uh, college, uh, the normal school, remained uh, much the same for um, much, of, much of a century, really, except as, if you look over to the right, uh, they added a laboratory school. Um, laboratory school was where those who were going to become teachers could practice, and it also functioned as a uh, public school for uh, the, the, the town. Um, and this uh, quite somewhat, I'm sure somewhat romanticized, but a uh, uh, lovely picture is showing a college in its uh, Vic Victorian uh, splendor. And Brockport was basically remain a, uh, a normal school for the next 75 years. Um, but before, before we, we end that period, I wanted just to talk briefly about two prominent women. Uh, one, uh, Mary, Mary Jane Holmes, um, who uh, would become um, the most, wide, most widely uh, selling author in 1853. Um, she would go on to sell over 2 million uh, books. And apparently the royalties she uh, gained were second only to Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, in, in that period. I remember when I came to Brockport and people talked about Mary Jane Holmes, I thought, oh, typical local chauvinism. Uh, and it turned out, not at all. She was, she was the, real, the real thing. Um, and her books, uh, as I say, sold uh, in, in, in the millions. Uh, and in this case, Lena Rivers, it was turned into three different uh, movies. Um, and there was a movie, oh, about 30 years ago, uh, showing a, uh, ste a steamer going down the Mississippi and on it was a poster of Edith's Entertainment, which was a play uh, based on a Mary Jane Holmes uh, novel. If you'd like any tangible connection to her, go into the Episcopal Church. I think it's about to open up. And if you go up, you might want to look at the, the baptismal font, which she and her Sunday school class uh, gave to the church in 1866 and remains in, in use. The other woman I'd like to talk about is uh, 1871. And um, see, Leslie, you were going to cut out just for a second, I think. Uh, there, she, two books have been written uh, about her lately. This is a, a collection of her uh, writings. And this is a full scholarly uh, biography uh, of her. If you'd like the names, email me, and I'll be gl glad to uh, send them uh, to you. And I'd just like to read briefly from um, 
Fanny Barrier Williams, an article that she wrote about her life growing up uh, in, in Brockport. Ours was the only colored family in the church, in fact, the only one in town for many years. And certainly there could not have been a relationship more cordial, respectful, and intimate than that of our family and the white people of this community. We threw three children were sent to school as soon as we were old enough and remained till we graduated. During school days, our associates, schoolmates, companions were all white boys and girls. These relationships were natural, spontaneous, and free from all restraint. We went freely to each other's houses, to parties, socials, and joined on equal terms in all school entertainments. We suffered no discrimination on about of color, count of color, or previous condition, and lived in blissful ignorance that we were practicing the unpardonable sin of social equality. Indeed, until I became a young woman and went south to teach, I had never been reminded that I belonged to an inferior uh, race. Um, her, her father and her family were, were very prominent members of the Baptist Church uh, on Main Street. Um, and she came back after her husband passed away, and they were very involved in, the, in uh, politics. She was a leader in creating um, uh, women's clubs, black women's clubs, and they were very much on the Booker T. Washington, uh, Booker T. Washington side of the Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois uh, struggle for uh, leadership of African Americans. Um, at the end of her life, she returned to Brockport, and if, uh, there is a historical marker in front of the house that uh, she lived at the, at the end of her life. Um, and if you just go down Erie Street from uh, the Fine Arts Building, it's about four or five um, houses down. Uh, sadly, race relations aren't always uh, a positive trajectory. And we have a little correspondence and, um, between her and a couple of the Black students in the early 1940s um, who were having a lot of trouble uh, getting, getting housing. So, uh, but basically that the founding years of Brockport, the reason we're here, and I'm wondering uh, well, some decades, anything uh, that you might like to ask, and I'm going to grab a coffee, Swig. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, or you can just make it known that you want to speak so we're not talking all over, all over each other. Okay, well, I guess not. If you think of things later, you can always email me at simple email, blesley at brockport.edu, or if you want the citations on the books on Fanny Barrier Williams, or a book on the 10 leading female authors of the 19th century, in which Mary Jane Holmes plays a leading role, and in fact, the book ends uh, with her. If you're interested in any of that, uh, just uh, e email me. Okay, well then, Let's jump uh, 75 years. We actually, then. we got a question in the chat here for you. Okay. Uh, Bailey Hartman is wondering how big Brockport was compared to Rochester at the time. Oh, what a good question. Um, I Truthfully, I don't know. Brock, Rochester was the biggest boom town in the, in the country in the, in the 1920s. It began late, the uh, towns are around it, like uh, Batavia, Canandaigua, or the market towns were, were bigger for a while. Rochester was a swamp, uh, but then when um, water power came in, then that that intersecting with the canal uh, gave Rochester its, its boost. Um, so I would assume by 1835, Rochester was much larger, but they probably weren't terribly different in, in the 1820s in the early years of the canal. So I'm afraid I'm afraid I don't have a very def definite answer. Unless maybe someone else else. knows. I mean, Mindy or um, some of you know more Rochester history than I do. Uh, anyone want to chime in on that? No? <laughs> okay. Okie doke. Well, then let's jump 75 years. And I guess we can go back to the um, PowerPoint. Okay. Um, Brockport was a normal school for 75 years. Uh, a little bit no longer than most states. New York was pretty, really late in converting its normal schools 
uh, to colleges. Normal schools had two or three de three year uh, degrees and were not very collegiate. They, they sort of straddled what we'd think of as secondary and higher higher education uh, today. Uh, if you graduated from the, the normal school, you might go on, on to another institution or to a college for a year or two for your, your degree. Um, but most people would have gone into teaching and, and the normal grads would have been the elite uh, of, uh, of teachers. At any rate, finally in 1941, um, the New York legislature fi finally agreed to convert the normal schools and Brockport with its uh, brand new uh, building then, uh, now Hartwell Hall, uh, had State Teachers College, of course, etched uh, across the portico. Um, such things became an embarrassment to some people later. Uh, we had a president. Uh, oh, Mindy, do you want to uh, say something? Um, say there's a link for the census records. Do you want to, maybe you can. I just wanted to add that I put a link to compare the populations in the 1830s, if anybody wants to check that out. It's in chat. And the link is on the chat? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. It's normal schools to, uh, to teacher, uh, te uh, teachers' colleges. Um, World War II came along and uh, really didn't didn't change really during the war. Uh, and the regents, and you, you New Yorkers know and love them, that marvelous, marvelous exams you all got to, got to take, were really pretty hostile to public higher education in general. Um, and in 1944, their post-war plan um, opined that Brockport might grow to 500 students by uh, 1950. Uh, well, they grew to over 500 students by January of 1946. Uh, and that would be to a large extent because of what you're seeing here um, of Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt signing the GI Bill. I should say too, that in that um, post-war planning document of 1944, each state college was given a specialty. Geneseo had library, uh, Oswego had in industrial arts, uh, and, and so on. Um, and Brockport and Cortland were assigned health and physical education. And of course that continues to shape uh, both Cortland and us to this day. Well, at any rate, um, uh, FDR signed the GI Bill, um, a, a bill that really everyone thought featured people getting their high school diploma uh, or vocational degrees. And they thought if, if couple hundred thousand might get go to college. Instead, 10 times that many went. Two and a half million uh, veterans uh, went on uh, to, uh, to college. Um, and a number of them answered that question uh, in the affirmative. But that meant uh, massive crowding. Um, the, as I think I mentioned, uh, Rockport hit over 500 students uh, in January of 1946, not 1950, as the re regents proposed. Um, and in fact, they, they delayed opening college for a week while they tried to find housing for, for all the students. Um, but for a couple of years, uh, classes were, were crowded. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see some of the students are wearing freshman beanies, believe it, believe it or not. Uh, the woman to the left, some of you may know, uh, and if it weren't for COVID, you definitely would. She was a regular at, at the gym uh, and at all sorts of college events. And she is the one who um, funded the Eagle's Nest over in Tuttle um, in honor of, of her late, late husband. Her name is uh, Rosie Rich. Uh, she said this was rather uncomfortable class to teach. She was just out of Cortland, about 25 years old. And uh, she and the subject... And uh, she said a lot of them had been in the service, and she was convinced they knew a hell of a lot more about the topic uh, than, uh, than she, she, she did. Um, and at any rate, uh, new faculty were uh, brought in. Uh, here is uh, Jack Crandall, 
Uh, I think it's possible. We have a scholarship in his honor. Oh, Mindy, you reacted. Uh, and uh, maybe some of the rest of you have been on the scholarship in his honor. He was just a wonderful man, uh, and a very popular dynamic uh, teacher. And I guess I can, I'll, I'll tell an extra story. He was teaching his last class and one of our colleagues, uh, the late Arden Buholz, uh, said there's a German tradition of colleagues attending the last class. I guess that's like Liz and Ann being at this one. Uh, and so we all uh, filed in, in one of those fishbowl rooms and he's getting ready. He looks up and this look of horrors on his face. He said, oh my God, this is pressure. The, the routine of the evangelist Billy Sunday, who'd been a professional baseball player, that the devil is chasing me in first base, and they slid into home for, for his last uh, lecture. So thank God it went well. At any, any rate, Jack was, was really a lovely person, and one of, those, one of the very popular uh, history teachers uh, at, at, at the time. Um, but being a state teacher's college, all students uh, were in teacher training. And here, uh, one of my favorite shots here is uh, a practice teacher leading uh, her students uh, in, a, in a parade uh, through what then was the, the uh, uh, laboratory school in Hartwell Hall, the north end of, of Hartwell uh, Hall. Or story time. Uh, there, there are fireplaces in Hartwell to this day. Most of them are, are hidden. Um, and uh, we published, Professor O'Brien and I published this picture in our book, not realizing that, that the little boy uh, at the top is actually a, a friend of ours, <laughs> a topper bot who had been uh, in, uh, at, who went to the, to the campus school. But of course, you couldn't get away from the, from the basics and uh, practice teaching. Um, and you'd start by practice teaching in the campus school and then, uh, then go out in, into the uh, public public schools, a system that worked very well as long as the college uh, was small enough that everyone could fit into the into the campus school. As I began to talk, when I talked about uh, Ellsworth, uh, I was saying that that was part of a bigger story of, uh, particularly at, certainly at Brockport, of veterans returning, wanting what they imagined to be the classic. Uh, college life. Um, it might have been added to by the fact that Secretary of War uh, George, George Marshall believed that education was a key to morale the troops and that a lot of education uh, was, had been going on um, in, uh, especially in, in, in Europe. A whole boatload of professors was sent over and, and, and so on. So among uh, the traditional college life, uh, they established a homecoming. Uh, here, uh, majorettes uh, coming, uh, not the right term, is it? But anyway, uh, coming down the street and right behind them um, would be uh, the band, okay? <laughs> um, I don't know if that's College Street, but at any, any rate, um, we still have the homecoming parade uh, to, to this day. Uh, what, how many years? It was 1948, so uh, something, 72 years ago, 73 years ago, that we had uh, the, the first homecoming. And, oh, I forgot this, Ellsworth. Uh, there was vicious competition among dorms and among other groups uh, to have the winning float. And uh, they would apparently assemble these in barns around the area, keep them, keep them secret. Uh, in this case, uh, a float uh, of Ellsworth, whether it, it won, uh, I do not know. We do not have that important record. Uh, and they, students wanted football um, and virtually all the uh, members of the first team uh, were, uh, were veterans. Uh, this is a bad moment, I think. Uh, the coach, Bob Boozer, uh, I love this shot. It, you'd think it was Hollywood lighting, but I think it was late on a Saturday afternoon and the light was coming from the west. Uh, and a uh, fellow over to, to the left was Jerry D'Agostino. He later coached the team and his wife uh, was and I were, uh, used to swam together uh, for many years. She just, just passed 
uh, away. And at any rate, there were many bad days for Bob. Uh, he didn't, his teams didn't win many games, um, uh, but his, his players absolutely uh, loved him. I remember one of the very different coaching style back then. I did an oral history with one of his football and tr players and track where he had a lot more success. And he said in the four years on two teams, he still remembered the time Bob got mad. A very different coaching style than we're, we're used to uh, th these days. And although football had be was sort of the archetypal fall sport at Brockport, in fact, uh, the biggest one uh, was soccer. And this, believe it or not, is the national champion team of 1955. We're not talking about Division Three. We're not talking about SUNYAC. We're talking about the whole nation. Um, Brockport and Penn State uh, were the co-national champions that year. The coach was an absolute genius. He was later voted in the Soccer Hall of Fame first round. Um, Brockport just had a couple hundred men, uh, and some of these guys had hadn't played soccer before they came came to Brockport. Uh, but he began an extraordinary period where Brockport regularly would beat West Point. Cornell, Syracuse, uh, other, other leading uh, schools. And certainly, especially a school featuring health and physical education uh, would have uh, a very active uh, and athletically inclined women. Uh, but at this point, uh, very, it would not be inter intercollegiate. In fact, most uh, female educators at the time felt it was unladylike to have that male kind of comp competition. Uh, and when they did have other schools, they downplayed the competition. Um, but so there's a lot today. And then, of course, you would have uh, dances. Uh, and if I don't know if you can quite see, but several of the uh, uh, dancers are, are clearly too old to be uh, students. Uh, these were all college affairs with faculty as, as well as, uh, as, as students. And there would be formal dances like these. And then I guess the much less formal, um, a pajama party. Uh, but it wasn't going to go much further than that. Here is a list of the uh, hours that uh, uh, sophomores and juniors had to follow. They had to be in by 10 30 uh, in uh, the during the week. Could it be out till uh, midnight on Friday and 1 8 1 30 a.m. On, on Saturday? All, all right. Um, but what about the weekends? Well, if you wanted to go out for the get away for the weekend, you need written permission uh, from your parents and have it on file and so on. Uh, I know this must seem strange, but this is sort of the world that I. Uh, grew up in and uh, I remember going to pick up uh, dates and there'd be this mean looking uh, uh, woman there who would be uh, making sure that uh, the visiting males never got past uh, her, her desk. But we have to remember it was a time when birth control was hard to procure, awkward uh, and undependable. Uh, it, was a, it was a very different world. You have to try to throw yourself into that quite different world to understand uh, what really seems so uh, silly to us in, uh, today. But you could truly get away. Um, Brockport had uh, camp in the Adirondacks, uh, Camp uh, Totem, um, designed for uh, particularly the health and physical education students to get practice in uh, running at camp. But I suspect uh, for a lot of students, it was a good way to get away from the prying eyes of the a dean of women and, and the dean uh, of, of men. Uh, by, by the way, I've been told that when uh, houses applied to, uh, to rent to students that the dean of women, dean of men would inspect. And one of the things the dean of women would check was that there wasn't a window uh, exposed to a house where there were, uh, there were men. Uh, the world would change after 1970. And if you, uh, here, uh, this is a very popular professor named Marty Rogers playing playing the guitar at Camp Camp Totem. He would later found uh, the recreation, the leisure and recreation uh, dep department. And if you couldn't get away, well, you could at least get get a coke. 
here, a classic. Soda, soda fountain. And comfortable as Brockport was for, for most people. Um, and, well, and let me just pause to say that uh, for about for 15 years, I gave keynote speech to the 50th reunion classes. Um, and we would get, we'd send out questionnaires uh, to them, which I'd use for my speech. So I'd talk about their favorite subject themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, And what certainly came out was the extraordinary sense of comfort. I'm sure there were lots of people who weren't, who probably either left left college or threw out the uh, uh, the envelope when our questionnaire came. But uh, an amazing amount of, of comfort, uh, common common purpose with uh, teacher education. Uh, and if anyone was interested, we uh, we then did a, did a, an article on this generation, uh, published it in a, in a national uh, journal, and I'd be glad to send you a copy. Uh, among the things we discovered was that the conventional wisdom at the time was that women would teach for five, six, seven years, uh, drop out for marriage, uh, children, and that would be the end of their career. In fact, what we found uh, was that women's careers were about six years shorter than men's. Uh, that is about the time to have two children, which was what most most had. Uh, and then most came back uh, back to teaching. So. They, certainly the teacher's college turned out both men and women very committed to teaching. Well, uh, but even if you, you were very comfortable, even worse if you were, uh, you eventually would be kicked out. Um, this is graduation. Uh, students having come down College Street um, and heading uh, toward a ceremony at, Hart at Hartwell Hall. And they were headed by uh, a daisy chain carried by uh, junior women. Again, whoops, uh, that's not a daisy chain. <laughs> um, now, this this kind of lifestyle would would dramatically change in the in the in the middle sixties. And I, I was in college from nineteen sixty two to sixty six. You know, and a year or two after I left college, I wouldn't have recognized it. But uh, this uh, which college life that must have looked strange to you, in fact, was uh, was very common. Uh, at at the at the time, uh, well, are there any questions on this on this section? Okay, well, either I've answered everything or I put you all to sleep. One of the one of one of the two. Okay, Doctor Kramer a... in the chat is asking what happened to the camp in the Adirondacks. Sadly, it was sold. in a little town called Fancher, um, which uh, actually would host a very important uh, history conference that I'll talk about in a little, little while. And when we hit some really bad days in the 80s, uh, enrollment tumbled, uh, New York economy was in trouble, and one of the cost savings uh, was to sell Camp Totem. So now we, we don't have a, an auxiliary campus, unfortunately. Thank you, thank you, Michael, for, for asking. Okay, if there are no others, let me turn to my third watershed, uh, which comes came immediately after um, the period that we, we were looking at. And as I said, uh, you know, in the time I was in graduate school, let's say uh, from 1966 to 1970, college life over the over the the country just changed out of all recognition. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, part of it uh, triggered by the by the Vietnam War, uh, and uh, a whole series of other changes, questioning of uh, gender roles, uh, the civil rights uh, movement, and this whole whippersnapper baby boom generation coming in be behind me. Well, um, the big the big transition really starts here with this friendly cup of uh, tea or coffee. Um, I don't know if you recognize, anyone recognize either. Um, on the right is Governor Thomas uh, Dewey, extraordinary man who really uh, modernized New York uh, 
and he had been such a crusader against crime that uh, the mafia put out a contract on him at one point and then decided uh, it would be wiser uh, not to. At any rate, he was the founder of SUNY, although really his only interest in SUNY uh, was in trying to create a public alternative in medical and health schools uh, to combat the anti-Semitism and the racism uh, of the private health and law, law schools. But beyond that, he wasn't very interested. Well, uh, in this picture, Nelson Rockefeller is telling him that he's thinking about running for governor in 1958. And Dewey is saying, no, no, Nelson, look, I'll get you a good job. How would you like to be postmaster of, of New York City? And uh, Nelson, who was uh, well known for using his middle finger, uh, probably didn't literally, but he did figuratively. Uh, and uh, instead, he would run, run for governor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, here was the original seal uh, of, uh, of SUNY created in, in, in 1948. And here is candidate Rockefeller um, running, uh, and that's an echo of him. Uh, he would run for governor. He would upset Avril Harriman, the uh, grandson of another uh, robber baron. Uh, and he came into office uh, determined as, a, as an educational reformer, determined to dramatically change things. He was really worried about what was going to happen with the baby boom coming. Uh, and he wanted to modernize the system. He uh, then completely uh, threw out all the restraints uh, that the regents had had uh, on, uh, on SUNY. Uh, he commissioned a uh, committee uh, that recommended creating the uh, four doctoral centers, of, you know, Buffalo, Albany, Stony Brook, and Binghamton, uh, that would uh, allow liberal arts at at the state colleges uh, and would create the community colleges and SUNY would just would grow exponentially uh, on, on, under him. His favorite uh, college professor, I'm sorry, college president, would be the man on the right, uh, Albert W. Brown. Um, and the man on the left uh, is Chancellor Sam Gould. Uh, Rockefeller loved Gould. He used to say he just loved being around him. And Gould, in an oral history, said his favorite president ever uh, was uh, Albert W. Brown. And the money started to flow uh, when Brown, uh, Brown became president. Uh, as you can see, it looked like uh, a horror movie that some monster had just gone through the campus uh, with construction uh, everywhere. Uh, the campus was just uh, dramatically uh, changed. Here's a, a shot of the of the college in uh, 1950, uh, basically uh, Hart, Hartwell Hall um, with houses right right behind it and uh, in, into what obviously is now now the, uh, the campus. But within 27 years, uh, there's a modern shop but within 27 years. Uh, this was the campus. Uh, so it gives you a sense of the incredible change uh, that uh, would occur. Uh, and pretty soon the campus was full of uh, brick and concrete boxes. Sadly, uh, Brockport and many other colleges, uh, rapid expansion at time was at a low point, I think, in, uh, in uh, architecture. Um, but the students came and they came and they came. Um, and you could see the effect I had. Uh, I came in 1970 and look at that. There's a perfect correlation between me and more than doubling uh, the, the, the enrollment. Uh, it was great for those of us uh, who just gotten our doctorates and needed jobs. Uh, not so great for students who were tripling, not able to get into classes and, and so on. Uh, so while a lot of us as faculty remember his golden years, uh, many of the students felt uh, quite uh, differently. The um, curriculum changed dramatically. Uh, the education major was, was abolished uh, and uh, instead Brockport saw itself as a liberal arts college. Education became a second major um, and uh, most of the majors were in the, uh, the arts and, and, and sciences. 
a um, whole new brood of faculty were brought in, including myself, uh, something close to 200 of us uh, around 1969, 70, uh, 7, 71. Oh, for, uh, it, it paid off to have been born before the baby boom, I'm, I, I'm, I must say. Um, at, at any rate, <laughs> uh, the job market was fantastic and has, hasn't been uh, since, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, so students were required to take an academic major, and even if they're going to teaching, uh, then as I say, certification would, would be extra. Uh, there was something of a liberal arts revolution. Um, the uh, old departments, like say social sciences, uh, subdivided in, now into history, political science, sociology, economics, uh, and, and so on. And there would be some new disciplines and yes, uh, this is what uh, it looked like when you ran your computer program uh, back uh, back then. Uh, quite a different day when you brought a box full of uh, punch cards over uh, and you just prayed that it worked in, in your, the 15 minutes you had on the machine. Uh, a very different uh, uh, time. Um, but clearly, especially in the declining economy of the 1970s, uh, there was a more and more of a call for immediately a, a, applicable um, uh, uh, professional programs, nursing, social work, criminal justice, recreation and leisure, uh, and professional tracks in, the, in, the, in physical education. Uh, and Rockport really didn't quite become the liberal arts college that it planned, instead became something that is called, and it's not a very useful term, a comprehensive college. That is uh, that you had a, a uh, two years of breadth, uh, of what we call gen ed, uh, followed by a major that might be in the arts and sciences or might be more immediately applied. Well, it was a very exciting time at, at Brockport, especially for those of us who didn't have to triple in a dorm. Um, for instance, uh, we had a unique Peace Corps program uh, came out of uh, apparently a fairly drunken meal between Al Brown and the head of the Peace Corps uh, that students, a Peace Corps volunteers and would go, uh, in this case, to Latin America uh, in, uh, in the summers in, in between. It was the only college that ever had that program. Uh, Jack Crandall here, the history professor, was, was the director. And among the people who came through it was a future president of uh, uh, Peru. Uh, the Delta College, which Leslie is part of, and what then was called the Alternate College, very much in tune with the atmosphere of the time, of course, had a very innovative teen taught uh, curriculum, one that I had the pleasure of teaching in uh, for several years. And the arts flourished. Um, if you know of Garth Fagan's dance company, most people no longer remember that it started at Brockport. It started with the name, the bottom of the bucket. Uh, and soon it was the bucket. And eventually as it became nationally known, uh, the Garth Fagan uh, Dance uh, Company. Um, and Garth spent his whole career here and followed by also Clyde Morgan and the, the San, Sankofa group. And theater thrived. Uh, in this case, the music man, uh, the person playing the music man in this case was a dean of the dean of fine arts at the time, Adam Lazar. And I always think of Adam when I walked into uh, my, my house on a hot summer day and I looked at the television and there is uh, Adam being cross-examined by P Perry Mason and about to confess uh, to, to murder. Um, another of the cultural uh, uh, exciting cultural activities that began then and still runs uh, is uh, the Writers' Forum. Um, virtually every writer of any, any significance uh, in the last uh, uh, 50 years has, co has come, uh, come through. Let's see, Bailey, um, I'm sorry, what escalated quickly? I see a question. Going from music man to murder. 
Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it did. I, I think uh, murder came first. I, I guess that I'm, I uh, assume I'm sure being music, playing Music Man at Brockport is the height of his career, not, <laughs> not Perry Mason. Um, uh, Writers Forum is hey, still with us, still very, uh, very, very active and about to bring in their uh, writer of the, well, their, uh, their fiction writer of the year in, in a couple of uh, weeks. Um, there was also the International Philosophical Year, which had a number of internationally known philosophers here. And for you history majors, uh, the new Social and Political History Conference was seen as the cutting edge conference in the country. It eventually was sort of stolen from us by uh, two professors from MIT and Penn, and Penn and University of Pennsylvania. Uh, who then created the Social Science History Association, but it all began, began uh, here. The student body also changed in a number of ways. Uh, virtually all students affected by the cultural changes, but beyond that, Al Brown realized that there were whole new markets out there. Uh, transfer students coming out of the new community colleges, uh, uh, urban working class, uh, African-American, uh, students uh, particularly. And so I'm, I'm af afraid I have to admit that that was more why uh, enrollment surged rather than my coming to the campus. Student life changed dramatically, as I said, I, between the time that I graduated and four years later came to Brockport, um, student life was utterly different. And part of the driving force, of course, was the Vietnam War. Here's a protest heading from Daly, uh, heading uh, down, uh, down uh, campus. Uh, and in April of 1940, after uh, the uh, shooting of four Kent State students, uh, students took over uh, Hart Hartwell Hall uh, for, uh, for a couple of days. It was all very, very peaceful. And uh, President Brown was leaving for a, a conference. So he sort of stepped over students, came in, got his files and walk walked out. Uh, and um, Brockport avoided the deep scars of, of some campuses, but uh, you get a sense of just how deep the feelings were. Uh, and there was also fun. Uh, for instance, on campus, we had the Raskeller, a bar where I, uh, I used to hold some seminars and, uh, love and decompress from class. Or there was our famous, or some people would call it infamous uh, spring in, uh, believe it or not, uh, public safety would drive around with a loudspeaker saying classes are canceled. Beer trucks would pull up onto the uh, piazza between Edwards and the student union. And we would all uh, have a very good time drinking and dancing. Oh, Mindy, your father has stories, eh? Yeah, I do too. But when Professor O'Brien and I wrote our book, we checked the spring in pictures carefully to make sure we were we were not uh, not in, in them. So some things changed, but other things remained the same. Athletics remained uh, central. And in fact, the soccer tradition continued. And when N the NCAA created divisions one, two, and three in 1974, yes, uh, Wendy said high schoolers, did you, Wendy? Hmm, oh, I wonder. Uh, at any rate, when uh, the NCAA created division First, uh, division uh, three championship. Meanwhile, women certainly remained uh, very active, but the type of activity changed uh, a great deal. And that women's athletics now became uh, intercollegiate. Uh, and uh, the old days that women, that uh, competitiveness was unladylike were certainly gone, as you can see uh, from, from this picture. And by the end of this period with these dramatic cultural changes, um, we began to feel a bit rootless. So we uh, sort of rest figuring we need to restore uh, some traditions such as the honors convo convocation uh, or scholars day in which began in 1984. Uh, or the uh, freshman convocation, uh, which many of you uh, have, uh, have go gone through. But before I end, I want to uh, just uh, talk about one glorious moment. 
that in a way signaled the end of this period of dramatic change. Uh, and that would be uh, the 1979 Special Olympics. Uh, on the left is Muhammad Ali. Uh, on the right is Rayford Johnson, uh, considered maybe the greatest athlete of the 1950s, the decathlon champion, who very recently passed, passed away. Uh, the Kennedys were here, a number of other famous athletes. Uh, the uh, Wide World of Sport, the most widely watched TV show of the time, uh, sports show, uh, came, came to Brockport. Absolutely extraordinary. And that a small college like Brockport held it, held it very successfully. Uh, and um, after this, only large universities or even whole cities have held uh, the Special Olympics. And of course, the Special Olympics have left a uh, tangible mark on the campus. Uh, here are the lollipop men that can look so lovely as we come out of the liberal arts building, out of our history building. Well, uh, Brockport I th was a real pioneer in mass higher education, flailed around in the 70s and so on, uh, eventually settling into uh, the model, helping form the model of comprehensive college as the United States settled into being the first country in the world while with Canada to have mass uh, higher education. And obviously student life had changed. The old in loco parentis of a strict parent was gone and now you had the permissive uh, parent. So to a large extent, I think the college as it was by 1980 would be pretty recognizable uh, to you uh, to, to this day. Okay, so that's, God, you've been, you've been, pay well, I don't know if you've been patient, you may have turned off your screen. all I have to say. Uh, are there any any questions? Uh, oh, 11 chats. Yeah, I don't. Um, I have I have a question, actually, Dr. Leslie. Um, where was the bar on campus located? Is that the one that used to be in the basement of the Union? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it occupied much of the, yeah, as you come down the stairs, I, of course, I wouldn't know how to get there, but <laughs> you come down the stairs and turn right, and uh, it was there. There were also pool tables and such uh, in, in the area. Yeah, I remember a very bad night with students buying me Colt 45s, yeah, but also some very good classes. And Wendy, uh, you snuck over at Spring Inn as a high school student, are you saying? You're on, you're on mute. I think she's denying it. She's muted, but I think she's denying that she uh, uh, stuck over yeah. to, to Wendy, spring you're in. And muted. Jen, <laughs> and Jen, Sorry about that. Yes, I did sneak over, and yes, I got in a little trouble with the parents, but damn, it was fun. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, oh, wonderful. And, and Janice, you knew a little bit about drinking on campus in those years, too, right? I, that, that, I no, I was always in the library. I don't know where you're getting that from. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we asked, I talk, we talked about this before. When did spring in end? I think I went to the last I, one and I had nothing to do with it ending. <laughs> was it uh, in 1979? I think it was um, 79 or 80. I think that picture I showed you was from the last one. It may be in our book, 79 or 80. Uh, it got... Well, it became a problem with outsiders coming on, on the campus. Um, but also then, of course, when the drinking age went back 21, that was that was the end of it. Well, it used to be on campus, like you were saying, how they brought the spring, the trucks would come in and everybody would be congregated down on the, you know, the actual, not quad, whatever. But then the last one that I went to, and I think it was 79, was they moved it off campus. It was like up by stage. There was a new writers of the Purple Sage was the band that played and it was uh, right. huge fields yeah. and stuff. It was up on a hill. Yeah. I have pictures still, from right. it. Still technically college. Uh, right, territory. it was still college, but it wasn't right. down where that was. I think that's what I heard. I wouldn't have been there, I'm no. sure. Yeah, right, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you're ab absolutely right. Uh, you know, it was in that field down toward, you said stage, uh, you know, we had a, a disaster. Uh, there were uh, dormitories built. There was supposed to be a state of the art, new kind of dormitory community and so uh, based and so on. Uh, and that the made of metal and that they would rust to a gorgeous brown, which they did and kept right on rusting. Uh, and eventually ha had, had to be torn down long before we'd paid them off. Uh, so quite a few, but that's the stage that, that Jen 
think it was the 16th in our building project somehow. Oh, okay. Because it was stuck. apartments. It wasn't just like the dorms that we all had on campus. It was big. It was much cooler to live in stage, but I never, I'd lived in La Chase. And first, yeah, the first exam period, it flooded four feet of right. water. Luckily, no one was electrocuted, uh, but some, something of a fiasco. Um, the old, last thing I would just say is if you find this interesting, if you're a history student, uh, consider perhaps doing some research uh, on it, uh, at least by next fall. I hope the archives will be open and you can actually get in and you know, deal with real primary uh, documents, uh, hold a letter from the 1840s or, or whatever. Uh, but even but until it opens, there is a lot on. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk to Wendy Prince. Uh, she she'll be able to direct you. Um, but a lot on the library website under archives, and then also in Digital Commons. Uh, numerous oral histories, about fifty student papers. Um, so if you if you'd really like to get, get your hands uh, dirty in in research, consider doing. If you're especially if you're going back next year, consider doing some research, making use of the archives. There are some fantastic oral histories done by Dr. Leslie himself, too, <laughs> that Dr. Kramer actually had us use in our digital history class uh, oh. last spring. Um, Glenn asked in the chat, taste. right? I don't know if you saw, but Glenn asked if there are any records of the discussions from the sociopolitical conferences. Wow, I should know that. My God, a good, uh, Professor Ireland is still... Oh, I think we have an oral history. In fact, we have an oral history of it that partly on that with Professor Ireland, it's on digital commons. So that's one place to check. Um, email me, would you, Glenn, bleslie at brockport.edu, and I'll ask Professor Ireland and Professor Ingham, uh, the two who, who ran it. It was quite something. The American Historical Review uh, uh, talked about it and, and said it was the only uh, uh, conference in the country focused on what was the cutting edge then, which was a very social science oriented, fairly quantitative and behaviorally oriented, very different than uh, what's the more popular history now today. Uh, it's much more cult culturally oriented. But, it, but Brockport was one of the leaders at the, at the time. Well, I think now it's time for the exam and I will hand out the prizes for the exam. Awesome. I'll turn right. it over I will to, stop uh, the recording to here then.